MyFantasySportsTalk.com. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is my fantasy podcast from MyFantasySportsTalk.com. Thanks for listening. Uh, we have a maddening show today. It's going to be huge, of course, but it's also going to be maddening. Let the madness begin. March Madness is here. Anyone excited for that? Uh, me. Uh, I, I've, got, I've got a fever, and the only prescription is March Madness basketball. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, classic. That's for everyone. I mean, how many how many people did you talk to today? That's filling out tournaments, guys. Filling out tournament brackets. So, seriously, I had people from work who I didn't know even followed sports tangentially, wanting to freaking fill out a March Madness bracket. This is the biggest. I love, that's what I love about March Madness. It, it, it anybody can get into it. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody I talked to was talking was talking about it, and uh, as I'm sure we'll get into, it only made me angry. <laughs> yeah, the only thing bigger than March Madness is the word tra- tangentially. I, I, I didn't even. It. I know I didn't pronounce it right either. <laughs> <laughs> Bad first words there. All right, we're gonna kick off the show and spend a good portion of today's podcast breaking down the field of sixty-eight in this year's NCAA tournament. We'll also talk about the winners and losers of the NFL free agency period to this point. A little bit later on, and we'll start out with some breaking news. A couple of stop headlines of the day today, so a lot to get into. Let's do it. It's Monday, March 14th, 2016. I am Brandon Reed, lead writer for MyFantasySportsTalk.com. Let me welcome in the founder of MyFantasySportsTalk.com, Dan the Man Shulk, and lead contributor and reigning contributor of the month kyle kirby dudes how's it what's going on guys hello man march madness is finally here Uh, i think we've all filled out at least one bracket so far and we're gonna get into that uh, in just a little bit and actually give you our sweet 16 picks and tell you who we think is gonna make it to the next weekend past these uh first couple of days of just um, madness to kick things off this year. So top headlines right now in um, it, Packers, a defensive lineman, B.J. Raji, going to take a hiatus from football. That kind of caught my eye when I saw it earlier this afternoon. Dan, what you think about Raji uh, uh, just hanging it up? Yeah, I mean, at, at 29 years old, I think uh, it's becoming more of a growing trend in the NFL nowadays. You see guys like uh, Patrick Willis last year, a couple other 49ers, Anthony Davis. I know he's he's interested in possibly making a comeback, but um, yeah, I think you're seeing a trend. They're seeing what's happening with health, health symptoms, CTE, uh, just overall injuries, and uh, they want to get out of the game, collect their paycheck, and get out. And I think it's a smart move. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. He will be missed, uh, though, for sure. And again, how old is he, Dan? 29. Yeah, 29, that's what I was thinking. Well, not even 30 yet, and we've seen that kind of as a pattern recently. Um, also got Martavis Bryant, and just, this is coming through as well, going to be out at least a year. Um, Pittsburgh Steelers wide receiver going to be missing some more time for different reasons and injury. Uh, Kyle, what you think about Martavis Bryant? I uh, saw someone on our message board today talking about Josh Gordon 2.0. Yeah. Are, are we heading down that path for Martavis Bryant? Yeah, I think we are. I think that's the easy comparison to make too. Uh, it's disappointing. He's a he's a great talent. I think he proves proved that again last year. He has he has the ability to really, you know, stretch the field and break games open. He's a he's a, one of those guys that you feel like on a different team might be wide receiver one caliber, but only because he plays with Antonio Brown, he's you know going to be the wide receiver too. Um, it definitely hurts his team. That's for sure. If he ends up being out for the whole year, they uh, they have a lot less to offer now in the passing game. Uh, it's 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 disappointing, but you know, it, like we said, with the, the comparison of Josh Gordon, it seems like some of these guys just uh, can't seem to get it totally together. Yeah, that's a shame because on the field he will be missed because that one after coming back after time served this year, uh, he made a difference uh, on that offense right away. So unfortunate for Martavis Bryant, but got to get it right. And what about LSU uh, missing the NCAA tournament and declining the NIT bid? So 
I hope you got to saw or see a lot of Ben Simmons in regular season or that um, thrashing in the SEC tournament. But that was it. That's the way his college career is going down. Dan, uh, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's tough. You know, you want to keep keep watching him play in a college because it's only going to happen this one time. He's obviously going to choose to go pro. Um, but it's it's tough. It LSU, I think overall, it shows how bad their coach was. I think it really? was. Yeah. I mean, they not only Ben Simmons, but they had a McDonald's All American on there to that roster as well. So. Former Tigers coach Johnny Jones, Memphis Tiger. Yeah, I mean, he just he. I think it shows his lack of ability of of coaching. I mean, it's and for Ben Simmons, like you can't really blame him not wanting to play in the NIT. It's I mean, what's it going to prove to him? It might only hurt his draft stock, maybe if he gets injured or anything like that. So it's good for him to walk away. I don't really blame Ben Simmons, but I gotta say, I can't remember a time. I may, I'm maybe I'm just my memory is is not as good as it should be, but I can't remember a time with a guy who is so perennially considered a top, uh, the number one overall selection in the draft having such a rocky season. I mean, the team just underperforms, and then the whole thing happened with the Wooden Award. His GPA isn't good enough. Why can't your GPA be good enough? You know, it's, it's all these little things. And I understand these are like, you know, small little nitpicky things, but just a very just underwhelming college, college year for him. Well, and do you want your last game to be remembered like that? That's what like I mean. They yeah. went out. Yeah. I mean, what was the final score? They scored game? thirty-eight like points, which is the, the lowest in any. Yeah, it's like seventy-one thirty-eight. Yeah. So, um, it's well. an intangible thing. I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not gonna. I don't know enough about him. I really don't to to make a really educated decision or, or opinion on it. But there's something about him. The time I've times I've seen him play, and the fact that this is this is happening now, like you said, this last game. There's something about him. I would be very, I'd be very worried. I think, I still think he's the number one overall pick, but he's not this runaway next LeBron type of guy that people were kind of comparing him to. See, I, th- I, th- I think he, he could be, he still is. I mean, his, his game, I think, is going to suit the pros a lot better than it does college. He, he's a, he's a NBA type player, and I do think I see him uh, equating to LeBron quite a bit, just in his overall type of game as a scorer, a passer, a rebounder. I think he's going to have the ability. He's going to have to add some muscle, but he definitely has the ability, I think, to, to do that, the skill. Ben Simmons, thank you for playing the game of college basketball. <laughs> we'll see you at the next level, buddy. Yeah, still a hard way to go out there getting thrashed like that and, uh, and then declining <clears throat> NIT bid. So, Well, that's an easy transition for us right into who did make it to the big dance this year. The field was announced yesterday afternoon, and um, you know a few surprises. You know you're always going to have teams who are disappointed they didn't make it. Going to have maybe one or two surprises of teams that did make it that you didn't think would. Um, then you got the seating and all how you know all how it lays out in the matchups, future matchups. So much fun when the bracket is announced. Even more fun when your team is in it. What do you say, Dan? Colorado. Yeah, I mean it's it was happy uh, it was a happy selection Sunday for me knowing that my team Colorado would be in the field. Um, obviously, when uh, if anybody checked out my fantasy sports talk today, they would have seen, saw my column uh, about how I thought the uh, the committee kind of kind of shafted the seeding of of Colorado, placing them as an eight seed. He's Not only as an eight admit- seed, but against the hottest team, I would say, in the country, uh, yeah. UConn. Um, it, it, admit it, Dan, you were hot. Salty. You were, you were, just, you were just hot about it. I, Dan, I, I'm telling you the truth, guys. It, so Here you go, everybody. Dan called me at 6.35 last night and said, let's do the show. <laughs> he wanted to do the show right then and there. He was that hot. Already had half the article written. Uh, so, yeah, I, I kind of – tough draw, though, too. Huh? Yeah, not only UConn, but if they can somehow uh, beat a, a team that obviously always does well in the NCAA tournament, then they have the number one overall seed in Kansas. And, uh, I mean, part of my article outlined that uh, Oregon State, who we talked about last week as a bubble team, um, you know, possibly not even making it in the field, who finished below Colorado not only in the regular season – uh, conference standing, overall standings, but they also lost to Colorado by 17 points. Uh, but they managed to get a number seven seed, which might not seem like a lot, but just the matchups alone, uh, first round and in the second round, are are completely, you know, lifted towards that that seven seed. So I think Colorado definitely was underseeded, and it it will hurt their their chances to advance. 
You got any surprises? What kind of stuck out at you, Kyle? I, I know um, I knew where Dan was going, but from outsider perspective, like me and you had without really a team in the fight, what what did you see that kind of stuck out to you as the biggest story coming out of the field of 68? One, one of the biggest stories for me uh, probably has to do with Michigan State getting the two seed. I think I, I don't remember for sure, but I think all of us had them last week as a one seed. I'm pretty sure we did. I don't know for sure. I, I would today, too. Right, yeah. And, and and I think that's kind of the thing that everyone is kind of talking about is how they kind of got shafted a little bit here getting that number number two seed. I think they're I think they're definitely deserving of the one seed, but you know the one thing about Spart the Spartans I think is that they have the ability to really play well when they're kind of considered the underdog. This is only going to motivate them more. I, I think that's the biggest story that's going to come from here. I think we're going to be looking at this team, you know, come the finals, come the final four, and we're going to be saying, well, guess what? That number two seeding really lit a fire under them, and that's what got them to the end. I think the good thing about their their seeding is they are in the the same bracket as Virginia, who I would Agreed. view as the fourth number one. So at least they yep. get that type of matchup. Yep, agreed. Yeah, and, I, and they're really the type of team we've seen them make runs before. I don't think it really matters, you know, what their seed is going to be. You know, you just come to expect Tom Izzo teams to be in the Final Four or at least be around the pitcher. Um, you know, of the Final Four contention. So I don't really see that changing uh, this year. No, we're going to give our Sweet 16 picks a little bit later on to come. Man, I, I guess one of the things that I noticed right off the bat, uh, you know, guys, is is the Tulsa. Yes. I, I really, Agreed. after Terrible. seeing Tulsa, yeah, you know, I got to see Tulsa up close and personal last, you know, week and a half, couple of weeks, and Memphis destroyed them <laughs> twice, you know. Um, so, you know, they're not just a bad team, uh, decent strength of schedule, 62, and RPI is 60. So you're talking about just right there, you know, borderline, borderline. I think they would still be a bubble team if we hadn't made selection study. But anyway, I just I don't think going in that they had the resume. Uh, there was more deserving teams, I'll just say, you know, yeah. outside of Memphis. But it, I don't know if you guys saw this. One of Tulsa's players tweeted out. Did you see this damn one of Tulsa's players tweeted out yesterday before the Selection Sunday uh, announcement of who was going to be in the field to one of his friends or fans or someone, and uh, they had asked him, are you in the tournament? And the Tulsa player said, nah, bro, we lost to Memphis twice. And <laughs> <laughs> so that's how the Tulsa players felt about right. it. And so a uh, big shock there. And I just I think they were m- probably more deserving teams. I really like St. Mary's resume. I mean, how can you argue with what St. Bonaventure did? And Monmouth Bonneth, yeah. was right there at the top too. And I know uh, going back a, a couple of a pod uh, podcast or so, I, I guess I just didn't research Monmouth, but they were a good team. That Dan corrected me about it last week. Uh, but they were a good team. A really good resume. But uh, kind of sticking with that podcast theme, uh, I want to talk to you guys about how about Pitt and Syracuse? We had them on the bubble, talked extensively about them over the last uh, week to two weeks, and Pitt ended up being beating Syracuse twice in the last uh, couple of games of the season. So you think they're in, but Syracuse got in too. Do you guys think Syracuse had a tournament-worthy resume? No. Not over these other teams that you just mentioned too, the Mamas, the St. Bonaventure, the St. Mary's. That this is this is the one that that stood out, stood out to me the most. I mean, Tulsa is definitely the the number one most undeserving team, but Syracuse is number two for me. Uh, and again, I, I mean, I, I we'll get we'll get to our picks a little bit later. I don't hate their matchup against Dayton either. I mean, I feel like this is a situation where they could win a game and then can move on to the next round when they probably shouldn't even been there in the first place. Um, to to lose like they did, like you just said, to lose a pit twice at the end there. This, this, this team and we had both it. those teams as a bubble team. We did. We're talking about both those teams as a bubble team. We did. Um, and Pitt beat them twice, so you're thinking, well, surely Syracuse is out. With, no, yeah, when I saw that second loss, I, was, I thought that was it. Yeah, they were. They to me, they were definitely not deserving at all to be in there. I, I mean, when you look at Monmouth, I, and this goes to the selection committee, I, I think uh, this is what what's ultimately wrong with with college basketball is is the selection committee. I mean, if you look at what Monmouth did, I mean, they had. 16 true road or neutral loss or wins. Um, yeah. I mean, that's yep. what the committee has asked the last five years. If you show us that you can put together a tough non-conference schedule and win on the road, you'll be rewarded with, uh, with a tournament bid. And I, they, they didn't have, they only had one home game until January 4th. 
in their wow. their season. One home game. Oh, wow. I mean, that's that show. They that's were on the road the for the first three months. It's yeah. Memphis didn't play their first true road game till January. Exactly. Like second or third. So I, it, to me, it's a, the hypo- hypo- hypocrisy of uh, of the committee and Monmouth completely deserve deserve to be in, and it it breaks my heart for those uh, those kids because I they ultimately they went on the road. They did what was asked of them in previous years. And now uh, they're left on the sidelines for what I would say is a brand name. You know, you choose a Syracuse with a Jim Beheim that's yep. going to draw more of a crowd than Monmouth. Yeah, I was going to say, did you guys, did you guys happen to see uh, on CBS the selection committee guy explaining some of the things? They're asking him questions about that, too, specifically. Like, what about these teams like Monmouth? Why didn't they get in? Why did why these teams like Syracuse get in? One of the th- he, his answers were terrible. They, they were they were not good answers. I don't know if you guys saw it, but he was basically just saying like, yeah, you know, those teams like Monmouth, they they did everything we asked for. It just broke didn't break out for break down well for them. It's like, well, wait a minute. Like, so what did Syracuse do that made them more deserving? It doesn't make sense. They lost five of their last six. Oh wow! Including including to a well, at least what I know for sure is to a bubble team in Pitt twice out of those uh, five. So yeah, I'm not seeing where the resume quite added up for Syracuse, but uh, like you guys said, name recognition is what it would have have to be. And, you know, maybe that's just uh, some ACC love there. They did get seven bids. Um, uh, you, you really saw, like, the Power 4 or so, Power 4 or 5 all, you know, kind of stole the bids from everyone. So ACC, Big 10, Big 12, Pac-12 all had seven bids. So... Um, I think at that point you're just taking the higher conference. It looks like that may have been a theme here, breaking it down like that. What do you guys think? If uh, uh, seven bids are awarded to the top four conferences, for sure they stole some uh, some Cinderella's bids. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, we talked about you know Cuse and Pitt, but you also look at Vandy. Um, I think they were more yeah. of a another name, but I mean they have they're a very talented team. They just don't play well. They're not they don't play good on the court together. But you know they have athletes that that can win. That they have the potential to. So I think that they got them in based on name recognition, based on passing the eye test, instead of actually looking at resumes. Yeah, I think they're gonna get waxed by Wichita too. Oh yeah, I I agree. And what do you guys think about the way I guess South Carolina kind of fell? They started the season I, fifteen and no. zero, and they were ranked in the. At least the top twenty or so, uh, for sure. And man, what a just an epic collapse there to not be in the field at all at this point. I had them as a lock. I it, a, literally a lock. Into, I didn't even think they wouldn't make the tournament. And I, they had the first. They had a crushing uh, conference tournament loss early, and uh, I, that ultimately I think hurt them. If they maybe won one game in the SEC tournament, that might have that might have helped. Yeah, they they really just crumbled at the end. They. They only played uh, two teams in the top 50 of RPI, and that was Kentucky and Texas A&M. So not, you know, good teams, definitely, but not like peret- like these great, great teams. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and this is a very, very bad end of the season. And we talked about this before, too. One of those things that really matters is how you finish a year off. You know, you think that, you know, the same, the same thing would be uh, said to Syracuse. Where I think we'd be talking about them a whole lot since they finished their year off so terribly. But, you know, it, it, that what have you done for me lately kind of mentality definitely hurt them in the end. It's kind of hard to figure that out, though, isn't it? Because, like you just said, Syracuse went the total opposite route, uh, losing five of their last six and uh, apparently making it anyway. So it's I don't think there's just one formula or one particular, you know, if you had to live your way and make your schedule this way, you know, or schedule these type of teams or home versus road, I just... I'm not sure that it matters. I just think they're taking in so many things, and with the parity in college basketball this year, I think it made it a little bit tough on them. I think that's ultimately the flaw, though, too, in the system. I mean, I think the committee needs to set some type of rule, like or or some type of rules to that teams have to live by. If you're a, a mid-major, this is you know playing that non-conference schedule, the tough non-conference conference schedule is supposed to get you in if it's not getting you in i mean what what else can they do monmouth literally could not have done anything else i mean no absolutely not and um looking kind of look at the conference breakdowns again how about the sec only getting three bids um uh, just you never know they have kind of have their ups and downs as a basketball conference but only three bids for the next supposed you know powerhouse five school 
the other four got seven. The SEC got three. So, what is it? What do you think about the state of just SEC basketball in general right now, guys? Uh, I, th- I, th- I think it's clearly uh, a step below what uh, with the other conferences, which is the opposite of what it is in football. I, you know, SEC is the elite college football conference, and everybody else is kind of uh, sub level to them. Um, but not only that, but if you look at the SEC, the seedings again with the committee, uh, A and M was a three seed, Kentucky a four seed, but yet Kentucky beat A and M in the uh, conference tournament. So uh, I know Calipari, you know, voiced his his dislike of playing on Sundays, and I, I agree. I think the committee uh, probably already had that seated before the game finished, uh, and I think that's another flaw uh, that we're looking at. But um, back to SEC. The see, that's off my tangent again. I the, the committee has me. I can't. <laughs> that's that's what everybody at home it comes to hear. Though, man. <sighs> my anger, my my true <laughs> frustration. Especially yeah. today. Oh, it's, 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 I mean, it's it, it, that, just a quick reminder to stop by my, my fantasy sports talk.com and check out all, everything we have going on right now. Uh, Dan has a, a few good pieces up right now while I'm thinking about it on college basketball. He has this preview of Miami and Buffalo first round matchup. The tourney times and the announce crews are listed. And then uh, this story, this story I wrote down. Um, Dan pissed about Colorado State. Um, <laughs> I, I forgot. That's not the real time. You didn't go. No, there. I, it, I, it, I it missed is. that one. That's what it. That's what it started with last night. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, just kind of going back to the SEC. So, how far do you think? First of all, let me ask you two part question for both you guys. How far do you think Kentucky will go? Are they a serious? Final Four are championship contender, and will they make it further than Texas A&M, who was seeded three? Uh, I'll, I'll go first on that one. I'm going to go yes to both those. Uh, I think they're a legit championship contender. They're coming together now at the perfect time. They've been playing very well. Uh, and I, I actually I, I got A&M getting knocked out early. Uh, we'll get to that later. But, yeah, I, I definitely I definitely think the, the Kentucky has a chance. I, I think they could get all the way to the Final Four. I don't think they, I don't know if they're a championship contender. That would involve them beating teams potentially like Kansas, Michigan State, you know, University of Virginia, depending on when they get. And I don't think they can do that. Or Indiana in the second round. Yeah, I mean, in, Indiana could lose to Chattanooga though. That, that that's that's one of those potential 12, 12 uh, over fives that could possibly happen. I'm not saying I'm going that route, but I I, I got I got Kentucky going pretty far. Yeah, I think Kentucky's hot right now. I mean, yep. they they ran through the conference tournament, and, and you know, Kentucky's all they have the athletes, they have the the first round picks. I mean, Tyler Ulis, the, the, he's unbelievable. I, I didn't, I've never really uh, watched him play. I watched a lot of the conference tournament, and that he that's a kid that that I know can play at the next level, and he commands that team like no other. So I have, uh, I mean, I won't go further than the Sweet 16, but I, I have Kentucky, and I also do have A&M. So uh, we'll get to that a little bit later, but I think the SEC will, with those two schools, will have a chance to, to advance pretty far. So here's what I'm looking at ahead for Kentucky, according to my bracket, a second-round matchup with Indiana. How would you like that matchup, guys? Uh, Tyler Ulis versus Yogi Ferrell point yeah, guard matchup. Yeah, that's phenomenal. Yeah, it's gonna be great. That'd be a, that'd be a special game for for the first weekend of the tournament. So we've talked about some of these uh, teams who made it and who didn't make it. Maybe we thought were mistakes and some of the seedings. Uh, Dan, of course, not happy about Colorado. Any other seedings that kind of stuck out to you guys as this doesn't look right, or uh, I'm not sure what they were looking at to see this team this high or this low? Uh, I thought uh, Iowa had a pretty uh, low seed. They were a seven seed, and at, I think at one point they were number one or number two in the country. I know they had a little bit of a slip at the end of the year, but uh, the talent on that team, I think, screams uh, look out the number two seed who I think uh, if it might be Villanova in the next round uh, if they advance, but they could be a scary team to, to make a run because I think they're a little bit uh, under seeded. Yeah. I actually have them uh, pe- penciled in here too, as one of those, one of those teams, they again, really hot start, but bad, bad finish to the end of the season. They're coming in without any momentum. There's that word that it's thrown around a lot that I don't really know how much it really matters, but I, I, you can make an argument that it does, at least in their case. You know, they, they're, they're going to be going up against the Temple team that I think would really like to play Villanova in the next round. Mm-hmm. Uh, and oh, yeah. that, that's, not, that's not exactly a cakewalk, but I, I was a very good team. They had potential to really, if they can turn it on, if they can turn it on, they can get, they can, they can get pretty far in the tournament, I think. 
And and how about the most loaded bracket or the least loaded bracket, guys? I was just looking at the South, and is that not the most loaded bracket? I mean, in my opinion, yes. though, uh, Dan is probably going to think so for sure too, because if they yep. can get by UConn, they'll have Kansas in the next round. But and also, so as far as seedings go, here's a team that I think may have been um, underseeded a little bit is Maryland. I just I really like that team, and to be seeded five, I think they're a dangerous team. If if it plays out and Candace and Maryland do get to the Sweet 16, that could be a stumbling block for Candace, I see, um, uh, with, uh, with Melo, uh, Melo Trimble and uh, Rashid Suleiman. Um, and they've just been a good team all year, and I expected them to go in. They were kind of one of the teams I circled as being a potential Final Four team earlier, you know, midseason. So that, that they kind of stuck out to me as one being a little bit underseated. What do you guys think about Maryland? Yeah, I mean, they, they have the talent definitely to do it, but the question is, can they put it all together? Can can Mello Trimble be the scorer, I think, that uh, he's been lacking uh, this year? I, I mean, I think he's shooting uh, in the 30% rate, or, uh, you know, under 40% from the field, and, you know, as a, as a point guard, you can't... Uh, he can't be doing that. He he's a great uh, passer, but uh, he's going to have to show up because uh, he's going to be pay- playing some big boys, uh, some big schools. So they're going to have to. Well, and that's another reason I kind of want to see them perform outside the Big Ten, uh, step step out of our uh, out of conference play. I'm sorry, uh, and and so we'll see. But they run into another big boy in the Sweet Sixteen of Kansas. Yeah. So top top overall seed in the tournament. You guys agree with that? Yeah. Sadly, yes. Yep. Because uh, Colorado's going to play them if they can get past UConn, and that's not going to be a, a pretty one. All right, so uh, this is just the first week of several weeks we have to go of this. It's a fun time, but we're going to get step into our Sweet 16 predictions now. Um, and, Dan, you, you scheduled off for Thursday and Friday, right? Uh, yeah, I'm on a little vacation coming up. And I do it every year. March Madness is my time. It's my heaven. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Um, so he he's going to have plenty of stuff going up on the website for sure if he's got a couple days off, guarantee oh, yeah. that. So MyFantasySportsTalk.com. You are listening to the My Fantasy Podcast. Brandon Reed, Dan Shaw, Kyle Kirby here. We're about to give you our Sweet 16 predictions. Who's going to escape the first round or the first weekend of the tournament? So, I'll start first, guys. We'll just go by uh, region, each region, and just give real quickly the winner of the game. So we'll start out uh, the round of 64, which they now call, I think, round two, which makes no sense to me. But anyway, this is the first round of the tournament, guys, in the south region. I have Kansas beating Austin P. Don't <sighs> do it. Do it. Well, that's yeah. a loss if we're yeah, playing do in the it. together. So good. Pick them. Yeah. <laughs> I have... Oh, they just they they just do it march after march. They get in the tournament, they're deadly. I don't know. That's going to be a great game, though. Let me say that's a great game. I pick UConn because I've seen them really close the last several days, and I just really like UConn. But UConn over Colorado is what I have in the eight nine matchup. I have Maryland over South Dakota, Cal over Hawaii, uh, and I'm going to take the winner of the Vandy Wichita game in, in this one over Arizona. Um, in the first round, so that would probably be my first semi-major upset. I would say. What team is that going to be uh, in 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 the first round? Um, uh, Wichita. Okay. It, that that's kind of the one that stuck out to me is, is who would because I, I Vandy barely snuck in the tournament as well. Uh, but anyway, getting carried on there. So yeah, I, I'm going to have Wichita actually beating Arizona in the first round. That's a that would be an 11 versus six matchup. Got my Miami beating Buffalo. Um, Sorry, Dan. Uh, that's all right. This is just not 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 your region. <laughs> Miami beating Buffalo, Iowa over Temple, and Villanova beating UNC Asheville in the two versus fifteen matchup. What do you guys got in the South region in the first round? Uh, I got Kansas over Austin P, just like you. I got UConn over Colorado. Nice, man. Yeah, and you know what? It's just one of the again. It's just one of those things that they're going to turn it on. I, I got. I, I actually, I probably would have went for UConn to go pretty deep in the tournament if they didn't have to face Kansas in their uh, their next round. But uh, alas, they have Kansas. Uh, I actually have uh, my first update being South Dakota State over Maryland. I'm not a big believer in Maryland, and I, I, I've, one of the things I'm looking for when I actually look for uh, big upsets in the tournament is the teams that can shoot the three ball pretty well, and South Dakota State can do that. So I, I'm I'm going to go with them there. 
Um, I got Cal over Hawaii. I also have Wichita over uh, Arizona. This is a team that's finally healthy. Uh, got a lot of recent uh, deep run experience in the tournament. Uh, I like I like Wichita a lot. I got Miami over Buffalo. I got I, I got Iowa over Temple, and then I got Nova over UNC. Hmm, no love for Colorado. Yeah. All or right. Arizona. Well, well, there's about to be a lot of love. <laughs> All right, so obviously, yes, Kansas. I have Colorado, and for everybody listening, remember the name Josh Scott, the center of the Colorado Buffaloes, four-year starter. Uh, he averages 18 and 10. In, in three assists, he's he's he does it all, and he's going to do it all uh, against the Huskies. Hey Dan. Mark it down. <laughs> Dan, is that the name of the jersey we're going to see getting pulled over his face in defeat? Is that yeah, why, no, why he's crying to his They're going to be cutting down some nets. Anyways, <laughs> we'll move along. Uh, I have Maryland beating, beating South Dakota State. And then here's the other one, Hawaii. I have Hawaii beating Cal. Cal is one of the most talented teams in the country that have three possible first-round draft picks. But Hawaii is a they're a, a veteran group um, led by uh, a guy named Yankovic. And I I remember in the, in the the beginning of the year, not to get off tangent here, but in the beginning of the year during a 24-hour midnight madness um, of ESPN's playing of the 24 hours of games of college basketball to kick off the year, I watched Hawaii at 4 a.m., Dominate uh, a pretty decent Nevada team, and this Yankovic kid can hit it from everywhere, all over the uh, the court, and he can he he's a big man, six eleven, who can uh, drive in the lanes as well. So watch out for him. But moving on, uh, Arizona, I have uh, Miami beating UB. It, it will happen. Uh, Iowa, which is a, a team to watch later on, uh, uh, beating Temple uh, and Villanova, of course, uh, knocking off UNC Asheville. My long-winded picks. All right, Kyle, I give up, dude. Dan is staying up till 4 a.m. in the morning watching college <laughs> basketball. Uh, I'll just photocopy your bracket and send it my way. I just got up early. Up. I went to bed. <laughs> oh, man. Dan is watching Hawaii versus Nevada at 4 a.m. I give up. All right, let's move on. In, in the next bracket, I'll go down to the West region and give our picks right there uh, real quick. So, First, uh, first um, game one versus sixteen. I don't see any upset there. Oregon over regardless who they play of who's at Holy Cross and yeah. Southern. Uh, no upset there. I'm gonna stick with my uh, AC bias here and pick Cincinnati over St. Joe's, which I think that should be a good game. That's one of the ones I highlighted as tough to pick. It's an eight nine matchup. They all are. Um, I'm going with another 12 first. Did I really do this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> when did I feel this out? Okay, I'm going with another 12 versus 5. Ivy, Ivy Yale League. Over what? Ivy Yale, League. Real life? Yale over Baylor. Yep, this is going to be huge. Okay. <laughs> Yo, I'm telling you, it's gonna it's gonna be huge. Is this is this their first time making the since, tournament since 1963? Right? This, okay, well, yeah. long time, long time. Okay, the tournament wasn't even the no. same. I think there was only like yeah. nine teams that got invited back then. Okay, so moving on. Yep, I got another five versus twelve. Yale is going to beat Baylor. Um, so I thought last night, or so whenever I filled this out. But anyway, yes, Duke is going to move on versus UNC Wilmington. I have Texas beating Northern Iowa. That's another one I circled though. That's uh, tough to call. Right there, uh, but I have uh, Texas over Northern Iowa, Texas A&M over Green Bay, Oregon State over VCU. They were one of our bubble teams, and uh, the Glove Junior uh, Little Mittens, uh, they call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they moved on. They got the tournament, and I got them moving on over VCU. Another good game though, uh, and Oklahoma over Cal State Bakersfield uh, on the two versus fifteen line. All right, so I went pretty pretty much chalk for almost this entire uh, region here. I got Oregon coming out. I think I think Holy Cross will win, but I don't really care enough to tell why. Uh, I think that uh, St. Joe's will end up beating uh, Cincinnati. I do have Baylor over Yale, but that's not as crazy of an upset pick as as I think Brandon might think it is himself. It, it, it yells. No, I looked at their resume. There was a reason yeah. I, I picked that. It wasn't. It wasn't just cra- total craziness. I, I like we'll Baylor. I, I do. They're a tough team. They're very physical. But I, I they, they've had some unimpressing, uh, unimpressive games this year. Um, but I, I, I will take Baylor in that matchup. I got Duke 
Uh, and the next one, I got Texas over Northern Iowa. Again, that's another one I highlighted. Um, I've got A&M over Green Bay. And then I do have VCU over Oregon State. We mentioned about the bubble bubble watch aspect of uh, your Oregon State. Not a lot of great games. I, I do like the Glove Junior, but I, I don't know. I don't think he's going to be able to get it done against VCU. And then I got Oklahoma. Tough, tough yep. schedule. They play a tough schedule. Yeah, uh, I'm similar to you guys. I, I actually some risk as well with it but uh i have oregon advancing st joe's they're hot right now they're gonna take down a cincinnati team that's probably still reeling after that loss um i do have baylor beating yale unc wilmington fellas nope remember that all right here's the thing about unc wilmington these kids grow up in north carolina they wish they played at duke they hate duke they hate duke because they didn't get recruited by duke they hate the players that play at duke they're gonna give them all they got, but I am going to pick Duke. That's gonna be a loud. That's that's gonna yeah, be. Yeah, no, loud. you're right, and, and and it's and Duke doesn't feel the same way for UNC Wilmington either. When UNC Wilmington, this will be the biggest game of their entire lives, and Duke will not feel the same way about it. Yes. So watch it. I'm not yeah, gonna pick right. them, but just watch it. Oh, you're not. You did all oh, that yeah, and that said was, all that, that was, just to say you're not on. gonna pick them. Uh, uh, Northern uh, Iowa, I do have taking Shaka Smart down, so there's no potential Shaka uh, Smart VCU connection. Uh, I have a and beating Green Bay, Oregon State uh, beating VCU. Oregon State is definitely, they. I believe they do deserve their, they're overseeded obviously because, you know, Colorado, but they will win. <laughs> Little and mittens. And Oklahoma. Little mittens. All right, no surprise there. Well, Dan threw a couple of surprises in there. Yeah, I thought he was going with UNC. I Wilmington, will in one but bracket, back but off the... not my real one. All right, well. Uh, Grayson Allen doesn't play for UNC <laughs> Wilmington. I'm, I'm going to stick with Duke there. Um, so, well, that wraps up the West. Let's go ahead and move on to the East region. In the first game, I've got UNC moving on. Uh, I'm, I'm just not even going to debate that. Uh, USC versus Providence. Here's one I highlighted, and um, as I thought would be a really good game, but I, I have Providence actually beating USC in the 8-9 matchup. I guess I highlighted all those 8-9 matchups. Those are always tough to pick for sure. Uh, Indiana uh, over Chattanooga in the 5-12 matchup. I'm going with Kentucky over Stony Brook, although uh, you know I've seen a little bit of Stony Brook this year. If, if things go south for Kentucky, Stony Brook could pull off that upset, uh, just like I think maybe Kyle or one of you guys earlier said about uh, maybe Chattanooga and Indiana not to give it away, but uh, there has some that that has potential for a couple of upsets meeting a couple you know uh, underdogs, a couple of underdog seeds. But I have Indiana Kentucky matching up um, in the next round in that one. I have and here's one I'm totally backtracking on, guys. If you remember uh, during our uh, bubble watch segment, as I said about Michigan. I had them in, but one and done. And I think you guys both had Michigan out. Um, they did get in the tournament. And here's here's the thing. And, again, this is one uh, I guess I, I did this. Uh, they're going to be playing Tulsa. <laughs> I did this last night, okay? I was just, I was – I, I don't know, just straight off the selection show, and I was just I was you felt in a my anger. mood maybe. But anyway, I'm still yeah, I'm I'm sticking with it because they're playing Tulsa, and Tulsa was just very unimpressive to me. So I changed my mind about um, Michigan being in and done. Uh, I, I'm going to have them beating uh, Tulsa for sure. Just no love for Tulsa at this point after what I've seen Memphis do to them recently. So uh, West Virginia over Stephen F. Austin, although that one could be a close one too. Stephen F. Austin has done things in the past, so West Virginia better bring their A game. Wisconsin, they were another one of our bubble teams. Uh, I said they'd get in, and they're playing hot at the right time. They earned themselves a seven seed, and I think they're going to beat Pitt in that first-round matchup. And then Xavier over Weber State, uh, two versus 15 again. Just uh, I'm not even going to break that down. Uh, Xavier is moving on easily as far as I can see it. Yep. Uh, I got I got Carolina. Easy one there. I also have Providence, too, and I don't think it's really an upset. It's hard to call a 9v8 nine, a nine an upset in, in general, but I think Providence is a better team. Right. I, I was the one that mentioned Chattanooga before, and I have been debating Indiana and Chattanooga all day. I like Indiana. I think Indiana is a better team. I'm going to pick Indiana. That, be, ah, yep, that being said, they're the type of team that when everything is working, it works very well. When everything is not working... It like it it can go downhill pretty quickly, 
And I think Chattanooga can capitalize on it. If if they're if the sh- if the shots of Indiana aren't falling, it's going to be Chattanooga's game, and I don't think it'll be that close. 29, 29 wins is nothing to scoff at, even if they're not in a great division uh, a conference. They're they're definitely a, a team to watch out for. But I got Indiana there. Um, you got Kentucky over Stony Brook, though I do uh, also agree that could be an interesting one. But I got Kentucky going far in the tournament, so I'm going going with the first win there. Uh, Notre Dame uh, next uh, over I don't know Michigan. Uh, who are, I don't really, again, two teams that don't really deserve to be there, in my opinion, but uh, whatever. But West Virginia will take off, uh, take out uh, S, uh, Stephen F. Austin, although I, I have heard a little bit about, about Austin being one of those teams to take to kind of watch out for, too. But from what I understand, they've been, they've been in the tournament. I know they've been in the tournament a lot the past couple of years, and now they might actually have a chance to really go for a run, uh, trying to remedy some of the past mistakes they've made. Um, I got Pitt over Wisconsin. Uh, I think that Pitt will take that one there, and then I got Xavier over Weber State. All right, yeah, no surprise. I got North Carolina uh, advancing. Providence beating USC. USC, I mean, they're on the same seed as Colorado. Don't even get me started there. But Providence has Chris Dunn, one of the best players in the country. Um I do have Indiana beating Chattanooga. Stony Brook, I really, I wanted, I went into the tournament without knowing where they would be seated. I wanted to pick them. Jameel Warney, their their player, he's a three-time uh, conference player of the year, scored 43 points in their conference final. He, I, he only missed four shots. I think he was 18 to 22, something like that. He was unbelievable. He's an unbelievable player. I wish they had a better seating, a better pairing than Kentucky, who's hot right now. Uh, so Kentucky is going to win, but I, I, I can't wait for that game. I, I'm excited to see him play up against top-level competition. Uh, Notre Dame, I do have advancing West Virginia, uh, Wisconsin beating Pitt, and Xavier. All right, that wraps up the East in the first round. Let's move on to the Midwest division or region. Starting out with UVA, they got the one seed. They're going to be taking on Hampton. I got Virginia moving on in that one. Texas Tech versus Butler in the 8-9 matchup. I'm going to roll with Butler in that one. And Arkansas Little Rocks had an outstanding season as well. They draw Purdue in the 12-5 matchup. I'm going to... Uh, I was very tempted to pick the upset here, kind of almost you know local bias, but I am going to stick with Purdue because Purdue has really been seemed to play uh, hot, made a run in the conference tournament. So I'm going to stick with Purdue there in the 5-12 game. Iowa State versus Iona. Uh, I'm going to go with Iowa State here. Um, when when they're when they're playing at their best, they're a dangerous team. Kind of fluctuated up and down the top 25 this year. They got a four seed. I'm going to go with Iowa State over Iona. And Seton Hall versus Gonzaga. I'm pulling the upset in this one, 11 over 6. I just really like Gonzaga and the pieces they have uh, with Sabonis. I remember watching his father, although I'm pretty um, dating myself pretty good right now, but his father was uh, one of the all-time great centers in the NBA, in my opinion, probably best passing big man uh, there was. So I'm going to roll with Gonzaga over Seton Hall, although Seton Hall is having one of the best seasons they've had in a long, 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 long time. Uh, but Gonzaga over Seton Hall in the 11-6 matchup. I'm going with Utah over Fresno in the 3-14. No upset there. Dayton, Syracuse. Yeah, I'm going with Dayton, Syracuse. You know, they played a lot of tough teams, played in the ACC, but not sure they belong in this field. So I'm just not going to give them the respect of beating Dayton in that first round. And, of course, Michigan State. I have them uh, making a pretty deep run. Not even going to break that one down, although Middle Tennessee is a team that could get hot and play dangerous in the 15-2, but I just don't see it happening against this Michigan State team. I think this is, uh, without a doubt, probably the weakest uh, region, at least in my opinion, uh, of all the regions here. Uh, I got Virginia. I got Virginia coming out ahead of Hampton. Uh, Butler over Texas Tech. I've got Purdue over Little Rock. This next one is, oh man, this was tough. I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna take Iona. Uh, I, I I think they're a very good team. They got a, this guy AJ English, who I haven't known much about, but with my research, he's a hell of a player. Uh, he averaged at least 22 points, six assists, and 4.5 rebounds per game. It's pretty good, and they're a very fast-moving team. Uh, you know, I think they can put up a lot of points. And th- again, like I said before, when I picked South Dakota State over in the South. I like the teams that can score a lot of points. They have the potential to really turn it on. If things are working well for them, those are the types of upset picks I like to go with. So I'm going to take Iona uh, in that one. I've got Gonzaga over Seton Hall as well for another uh, pretty big upset here. Um, and then I have uh, Utah over Fresno State. 
This next one, oh man, this is another tough one for me. I, I'm gonna go with Syracuse. I'm gonna go with just the 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 experience of of Jim Beheim. I think it does matter. Uh, so I think they're gonna win that one there, and then I got Michigan State. All right, uh, no surprise, Virginia advancing. I do have Butler beating Texas Tech. Uh, Purdue over Little Rock, who who had that they had the diff, highest differential in win total from one season to the next. I think it was they improved 16 wins this year, so good for them. Uh, I enjoyed watching them play in the conference uh, tournament. Uh, I have a Iowa State beating Iona, although it, I I wouldn't be surprised if Iona can can pull it out. I'm surprised both of you guys have Gonzaga, Seton Hall. They are hot right now. They blew through the Big East, uh, beating they Villanova. Um, some top teams. They have Isaiah Whitehead and McDonald's. American, who is a stud, um, I can see them actually going pretty far, uh, far in this tournament. And and like UConn, they... Gonzaga's got the tournament yes, experience. Yes, well, that, that well, was Seton Hall has the this. talent. We'll see. Seton Hall is very hot. Gonzaga's <laughs> a proper Cinderella team this year too. <laughs> Let's not forget that they're best yeah. Cinderella. Eleven versus six. Uh, yeah. I do have Utah beating Fresno State. Dayton over Syracuse. I don't even think that game's going to be close. I was actually, two years ago, Dayton and Syracuse played in the tournament together. I was at that game, and Dayton blew Syracuse out of the building. Wasn't even close. Um, and I have Michigan State over Middle Tennessee. Yeah, I, I, just real quick on the Dayton-Syracuse. I, I am very sure I will probably be totally wrong. In <laughs> but I think either team gets beat by Michigan State the next round, so if I'm wrong, it's not going to kill my bracket. Dayton's a tough out in the tournament. I think they can give Michigan State a run for their money. All right. That Yeah, that's a pretty good uh, second-round matchup right there if it does hold true to be Michigan State and Dayton. And um, but just, again, real quickly on – Gonzaga and Seton Hall, though, even if Gonzaga wins in the 11-6 game, not a huge upset there, is it? No, not necessarily. I mean, I get- to me it will be because there's no chance in my mind that Gonzaga will win that game. Uh, Whoa. But, yeah, oh, I, oh the wow. Pirates are for real. Remember the name, Isaiah Whitehead. Did you forget it? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. I mean- I guess you never stayed up to watch Gonzaga basketball no, they when you're. No, they didn't do it for me. It's time zone. Okay. There. Hawaii nope. will be up. Hawaii okay. plays late. They're out there, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's true. But I got to be able to sleep and then get up for them, so it worked. Yeah. Out. All right, well, we'll see how that works out. So let's move on. Round of two, we'll start back off in the south region. I've got a matchup of Kansas versus UConn in the second round. I'm going to take Kansas moving on. I called Maryland in the first uh, game over South Dakota, and I got them playing Cal. So Maryland over Cal. I think Maryland is one of those teams. Again, mentioned a couple of names there. If they're if they're hot, they got the right guys that could succeed in a tournament type situation. I got them over Cal to meet Kansas in the Sweet 16, and I've got Wichita over Arizona. So I'm gonna go with. Uh, what was that, Arizona? Yes, and Miami over Buffalo. So uh, here's another team that I think could make a deep run. If you look at their resume, Miami is a dangerous team. Beat everybody in the ACC this year. Any Everybody uh, that was good, that is, pretty much everybody. So uh, I got them beating Wichita State. I don't think that's going to be close. Again, Miami, watch out for them. I think that could be one of those. Well, I mean, they're a three seed, but they could shock some teams and possibly even beat Kansas in the next round if it com- comes to that, in my opinion. I got Iowa over Temple and Iowa playing Villanova over UNC Asheville. So in the Iowa versus Villanova matchup, I'm going with Villanova. So in that Sweet 16 matchup, I'll have Miami, the three seed, versus Villanova, the two seed. Pretty much all chalk there, guys. Yeah, uh, I'll go with mine. I, I got I got Kansas uh, facing off against UConn. Kansas victory there. First team in the Sweet 16 for me. I got South Dakota State against Cal. Against Cal. I got Cal winning that one to face off against Kansas in the next round. I got Wichita State against Miami, and I've debated this one quite a while because I really do like Wichita State. I think that if they were healthy the whole year, they'd be seated much higher, and we wouldn't be considering them an upset pick. But I'm going to take Miami anyway. I, I, I like that team. I, I, I think they're going to get there. Then I got Iowa over Villanova. I got Iowa breaking the hearts of Villanova fans again. Heartbreak again for Nova. Uh, Iowa facing off against Miami, so that gives me Kansas, Cal, Miami, and Iowa in the Sweet 16. Wow. All right. Uh, number seven seed yep. in the Sweet 16. Uh, two years ago, let me start this off. Two years ago, Colorado played a then number one Kansas. Oh, my God. And beat them 75-72 <laughs> in Boulder. It's possible. 
It is. And that's what I'm going and believing. And I will not be surprised at all if Colorado pulls it out. I'm going I'm going to pick Kansas. Um, you will not be surprised at all. But at I, all. At all. I, I, <laughs> okay. so part of me expects Colorado to pull a miracle this year. So, But anyway, we're not going to get hung up on that. I have Kansas advancing. Yankovic and Hawaii are going to beat Maryland. So Whoa. Brandon's uh, wow. tough or vision of, of Maryland going far will get stuffed by Yankovic. How many sweet 16s? Is uh, not right? many, if any. And then I have uh, Miami beating Arizona. Miami is a good, uh, they're a senior bunch. Uh, Jim Laranaga, who brought uh, George Mason to the Final Four a few years ago. He's now the coach there, so uh, he definitely is. Very talented oh, yeah. backcourt. Um, I, I as well have Iowa beating Villanova. Uh, Jared Utoff, he's a scorer, and I don't see anybody on Villanova that can stop him. All right. So not Villanova not getting much respect from you guys. Nope. Um, so we'll, we'll see if that uh, holds to be true. One of my favorite names, Arch Diakono. So let's move to the West, and I've got Oregon playing Cincinnati in the second round. I've got Oregon beating Cincinnati, Yale versus Duke. I got Duke winning that matchup to go to the Sweet 16. Texas, Texas A&M. I think the committee knew what they were doing on this one. If it does hold to be this matchup, that's going to be a pretty good matchup, especially since these two don't get to play each other anymore since they've or since A&M moved to the. Um, eight, uh, SEC, sorry. Now I've got Texas A&M winning that battle if it does come to that. Texas A&M over Texas. And Oregon State versus Oklahoma. Little Mittens, the Glove Junior, got them beating Oklahoma. Um, and here's the thing. I may be way off base on this, and I know Buddy Hield is, to me, he's the second best player in the country behind Denzel Valentine. But I've seen them play a lot of games this year, and they've looked really good. But I also saw them play Memphis early on in the season, and Memphis hung with them. And I just, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just didn't see it. Buddy Hield was a superstar, but I didn't see it. So I know they've pretty much done their best of proving me wrong all year long. They end up getting the two seed, and I'm not backing off my prediction. I say Oklahoma will go down somewhere early in this tournament. I just ha- I happen to uh, pick the first available chance <laughs> outside of two versus 15 matchup, and I've got Oregon State beating VCU and then knocking off Oklahoma to make it to the Sweet 16. Wow. All right. Well, I'm going to start there uh, so I can disagree with you. Uh, I got Oklahoma uh, going up against VCU and winning there. Uh, we'll be getting more into that probably next week, but I like Oklahoma a lot. I like Buddy Hill. I think he's going to get it done. Um, I also have uh, – I'm going to go – I guess since, since, since I start at the bottom, I'll go up from here. I got Texas going up, up against a and I'm going to go with the upset with Texas. They have a very they have very strong strength of schedule this entire year. Uh, good coach, like we mentioned before, Shaka Smart. Uh, you know, battle-tested team. I think they get it done in a, in a good rivalry game there against a and um, I got Baylor going. I got Baylor going out and beating Duke because uh, I want to see that happen. That's more of a personal choice. Uh, and then I have Oregon uh, facing off against St. Joe's and winning that one. So that gives me Oregon, Baylor, Texas, and Oklahoma. Yeah, I have Oregon uh, beating St. Joe's. I think that'll be actually a pretty uh, handily handled win by Oregon. Uh, if Baylor um, beating Duke, although it could be UNC Wilmington, but it's Baylor advancing. Uh, A&M beating Northern Iowa and Oklahoma advancing past Oregon State. I'm 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 on the Buddy Hield bandwagon. Yep. I think uh, I think he can get it done at least to the Sweet Sixteen. All right, we'll see what happens out of the West. Let's move on to the East region, and in the second round, mat- top second round matchup, number one seed, I have North Carolina beating Providence. And moving on to the Sweet 16, I have Kentucky beating Indiana in what I think should just be an excellent game right there uh, if it does hold to be true. Four versus five, I got the four seed Kentucky moving on to the Sweet 16. And in the next round, West Virginia over Michigan. That's a would-be um, 
uh, the, the next uh, Sweet 16 matchup there. And again, I just totally backtracked on Michigan. I said that they'd be one or in and done. And um, I just I think they're going to pull off the upset there, not only beating uh, the round of 68 or the first four in matchup, but then beating Notre Dame. But their luck uh, comes to an end against West Virginia. West Virginia three seed in the Sweet 16. And Xavier over Wisconsin. I really like Wisconsin. I think they're clicking at the right time, but I also really like Xavier coming in at that two seed. They were solid all year long. So Xavier beat with, beats Wisconsin, and I'm going all chalk there, guys. Uh, one, two, three, and four seed. Moving on to the Sweet 16. Out yep, I'm, I'm going to go just like you. I'm going to go all chalk with this, so I'll make it quick. Uh, Carolina over Providence. Uh, I got Kentucky over Indiana, though I do think there's a small potential for that being Chattanooga, but I, I, I would like to see Indiana versus Kentucky more. I think that will be a good game. But I do have Kentucky uh, getting out of that one. West Virginia over Notre Dame, uh, and then Xavier over Pitt. Yeah, uh, Sally, I'm with all you guys. Uh, North Carolina, I think if anybody has a chance to lose out of those, you know, the one, two, three, four seeds, I think it actually could be North Carolina against the Providence team that is very talented. Uh, but I have Kentucky advancing past Indiana, West Virginia past Notre Dame, and Xavier over Wisconsin. All right, so let's move on. Very last region, the Midwest region, Virginia and Butler. I have in the second round matchup. I'm going to go with, actually, here's another one, guys. Uh, Butler, did I do that too? Did I do that too? Uh, that's it. Uh, Virginia and Oklahoma. Those are the two. I just. I, I don't know. Uh, I just. I think there's going to be some upsets there. You got to pick them someplace. And honestly, I'm kind of looking at an easier road for Michigan State when I was looking at that. So, uh, but anyway, uh, I think Butler is talented enough to beat Virginia. Virginia slips up. So big one seed going down there. Next up, Iowa State versus Purdue. I've got Purdue winning that one. And next matchup, I have Gonzaga winning again, beating Utah 11 versus 3. Gonzaga making the tournament run to get into the Sweet 16. Then, uh, no surprise, I'll tell you guys, I got Michigan State going pretty far. I got them beating Dayton. So, uh, Butler, Purdue, Gonzaga, Michigan State top that Sweet 16 out of that. I, mean, I don't know if I can. I actually am a little bit similar to you in one place, though. <laughs> uh, I got I got Virginia over Butler. I'm going to go with that one. So, that's not that's not where we're similar. Uh, I do. I do have Virginia okay. over Butler, though. I do think that there's a lot of potential for them to be that team. I, I guess knocked out. I, I have Purdue. Go, I have Purdue beating Iona in the next round. Round, and then that Virginia versus Purdue game is the one that I have my eye, eye on. That's a, as where uh, Virginia will actually get knocked out there. They they could have easily been a two seed, and we wouldn't have been talking about it being that big of an upset if they lost. So uh, it, I got I got them being Butler. Like I said, I got Purdue Purdue being Iona. I like you. I have Gonzaga over Utah. Uh, I, 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 that's a, that's the team I'm gonna go with. I'm just gonna go with that team, and I'm gonna hope that they uh, make a run here. Uh, I got, um, and then I got Michigan State over Syracuse. Uh, so that gives me uh, Virginia, Purdue, Gonzaga, and Michigan State. Uh, man, I'm glad we're doing a bracket together, guys. <laughs> uh, I have, I have. What does well, that well, mean? I mean, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, I have Virginia beating Butler. That's well. That's one of them right there. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, I have Purdue uh, advancing over Iowa State. Um, I have Seton Hall. I mean, come on, Seton Hall. Seton Hall over uh, Utah. I mean, you guys have Gonzaga. That's not even gonna happen there. So, um, so Seton Hall, watch out for for that. Like I said, Isaiah Whitehead, and I do have Michigan State no, over Dayton. Nope, you ain't got it. You ain't got to explain no more. You're you're not on the Gonzaga bandwagon. Okay, okay, we accept. Jeez. <laughs> All right, we'll see. That was a lot of fun. So we do have some uh, difference of opinion all the way across there, guys. But. It's going to unfold very shortly, and by this time next week, we're going to be telling you who we think are making the runs all the way to the Final Four. So that's going to wrap up our NCAA tournament segment, and hope you guys enjoyed that. You're listening to My Fantasy Podcast from MyFantasySportsTalk.com. Brandon Reed, Dan Shaw, and Kyle Kirby here. We're going to transition into 
the NFL and talk a little NFL free agency winners and losers. And we were discussing earlier, guys, I think we pretty much all agree a big winner so far has been the Jacksonville Jaguars. Yeah, I, I agree. I, they, they made some of the best uh, signings on defense and free agency, the getting uh, – Tayshawn Gibson and Malik Jackson there. I think they're going to be one of those teams that really they're, – they're deciding to make a push, which I appreciate. They still got a ton of cap space. Uh, they add a little bit of depth at running back with Chris Ivory, which I, I don't know if I totally agree with that move 100%. I mean, I like TJ Yeldon, but I think that, that allows TJ Yeldon to do what he does best, which is more of a pass-catching role. Uh, so you got the guy like Chris Ivory who's going to run a little bit more. you got TJ Yeldon who's more of a pass catcher. Um, and to me, when we're talking about winners and losers in this kind of context – they're in a weak division, and now they made themselves a lot better. Their offense is young. They're going to get better this year. This is a team that, you know, with these moves, it, you know, and things break right for them, they could find themselves. I'm not going to say they're in the playoffs, but they could find themselves in playoff contention. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think the Jaguars had a, had a solid offseason. I like what they did on defense. Obviously, they have a lot of cap space. The one move that I do question is that Chris Ivory move. Not necessarily yeah. because of Chris Ivory as a player. I think he's a solid back. Uh, he's getting a little bit up there now in age, but you, you dish out over $7 million a year. to it's a lot of money. Yeah, that's that to me is ridiculous. And a five-year contract. I would never get a, give a running back in the NFL a five-year contract. Well, let me ask you, Dan, real quick. Do you think T.J. Yeldon and uh, Denard Robinson are good enough to no, carry the no, backfield. No, no, I definitely agree with with getting a a running back without a doubt. But you don't need to pay one seven million over seven million dollars a year. Who's who's had a lot of carries in the last few gotcha. years? Yep. And I'm not going to bash that too much because uh, I was. It, and you're probably spot on, Dan, with the money uh, situation, and that almost was. Or maybe a little bit of a panic move. I don't know if they were talking to other guys or not, but I definitely think they needed to um, get a little bit bigger uh, at the running back position because uh, they were not great last year, um, and you know, uh, just just needed uh, some some kind of uh, other game to add to Bortles and the uh, brothers Robinson, and um, nah, you know, they got a pretty good uh, tight end set too, but. Um, I just think you need a little bit more of a running game to complement that passing game and uh, maybe make that next leap into the playoffs. But uh, definitely agree, they have had quite a big free agent period to start and just picked up uh, Prince Amukamura. Um, when was that? It was recently. That yeah, was late kind last of a, week, a late they, uh, they announced it. To go pick. Yep. And so they were also second, kind of hitting on that point, they were second, uh, tied for second worst in the NFL in rushing, 92 yards per game last year and only got five rushing TDs. So that, to me, is a glaring problem, and you need to do things uh, to shore that up. And uh, I think they have a really good GM, David Caldwell. He's at least out there trying uh, like another team. In that same division I'll stick with, uh, my Tennessee Titans, and – Man, loving what John Robinson is doing. They started out with the DeMarco trade while we were on the air this time last week and then went on to sign uh, the Texan center Ben Jones, signed Dolphins wide receiver Rashard Matthews. And although I know Dan doesn't like this at all, or uh, maybe he's just mocking me, uh, but they also signed former Cowboys QB Matt Castle, who played a little bit for them. But I think that's just strictly as a, a, a third-string option. Uh, and also, I mean, I'm really surprised they haven't got more discussion or trade uh, talk uh, scenarios going with other teams for uh, Mettenberger because I still really think Mettenberger might be a starter in this league. He needs his chance to see. Mariota just came in last year and just signed too well and uh, just absolutely solidified that spot for sure. But their offense was third-worst in the NFL last year. So, uh, John Robinson is clearly doing things to beef up that offensive side of the ball. So I, I think uh, you guys would agree they've been a winner so far in free agency, right? To at least come in here and make some moves and shake things up because we hadn't seen that from yeah, them. Yeah, definitely. The and the, the the reason I say that because you know obviously you know my feelings about Demarco Murray. I think he's he needs to be in a specific specific system, but. Uh, the fact that they only swapped fourth round picks, I mean, they got them for absolutely nothing. So, uh, they, if they have the cap space, fantastic move for the Titans. Yeah, agreed. And and just to reiterate the point I made before about Jacksonville, this is another situation where they're improving in the weak division. You know, they're they're trying to make a make a push here, and they definitely can with those moves. 
Yeah, and it, well, we. You know, I don't think the other teams that we talked a little bit about Houston, but I don't think the Colts are doing enough to really bounce back off of a down year. I don't think throwing a bunch of money Ugh. at Dwayne Allen is, is enough, and that's not really helping your team. Um, as well, and I know Andrew Luck had some injuries last year, but um, hey, maybe try to shore up that offensive line a little bit, and uh, I don't know, do something because, like I said, throwing money at, at uh, Dwayne Allen and letting Fleener go is, is not going to make your team that much better. But uh, anyway, with the Titans that Demarco Murray traded, as Dan was saying, I really love that because they are definitely trying to solidify their offensive line. Uh, drafted Taylor Lewan a couple of years ago. They signed Ben Jones, get Chance Warmack. And still, with that number one pick in the draft, a lot of different things you could do there. Most likely scenarios, they'll draft Laramie Tunsil. And, man, is that going to be uh, – where would you rank that as far as offensive lines next uh, year, though, Dan? Pretty solid. I mean, the fact that uh, you already have your franchise quarterback, you, you have a running back that can get you somewhere for the next couple of years, and you're building a, a solid offensive line. I think the Cowboys you know, showed last year, you know, the previous year uh, – um, that an offensive line in a running game with DeMarco Murray um, is something that you can live by and uh, and roll it right to the playoffs. And uh, if they do go ahead and draft Tunsil, you can check my draft profile out on the site, um, but he's by far and away the best tackle in the draft. Um, and you're getting a guy that not only excels in the run game, but also the pass game. He's, he's a mauler and he's aggressive and he's a sh- almost a sure thing. Who else you like, well, Kyle? as far as winners go, I, I'm going to move away from the team concept. I'm going to kind of give a shout-out to the former Bengals wide receivers, Marvin Jones and, Mah- and uh, Mohamed Sanu. Got, got some pretty big paydays. Kind of, I think that their, uh, their contracts there kind of uh, emphasize the lack of talent that was in this uh, free agency market here for wide receivers and also kind of in the draft as well. I think that a lot of teams kind of looked at those two guys and other other receivers as well and kind of felt, you know what, we need to pay a little bit of money to get these guys who are going to be good players for us and definitely contribute. Not going to be great players, but you know Marvin Jones gets a big contract to replace Calvin Johnson. Uh, Sanu gets a good payday going to Atlanta. You know the Bengals are going to suffer a little bit on offense. I think from this, it's definitely not going to be too good. I think they're going to they're going to be hurting a little. Um, but you know that. Yep. And those guys need to send some watches. You ain't kidding. Andy Dalton. Yeah, way that, or you ain't kidding. They, 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 <clears throat> Some yeah, no, agreed. Yeah, definitely. I think that he he definitely helped them out. Maybe this uh leads to uh fantasy breakout star Tyler Eifert to you know continue to play as well as he did all last season. But you know, as a whole, definitely the Bengals wide receivers they got some they got some good money. Yeah, I'm with you. Back to just with a player that that cashed in, Oliver Vernon. I have him as a winner and the Giants as a loser because the Giants dished out that type of contract who I who I didn't even have as my. Uh, not even in my top five defensive free agents. I know Vernon's a good player, um, but $85 million over five seasons, which uh, was the highest ever for a defensive end and the most guaranteed money, I think it was over $53 million. Um, the, man, that's that's a lot, and I, I just don't see the value there. Well, to stick with the Giants, now they really have been spent a lot of money. Definitely throwing money the defensive way, yeah. Um, and one of that kind of leads me to another winner on the individual uh, theme is JPP. He still got ten million dollars <laughs> with one good hand. Um, so I just I didn't really see that, but they definitely wanted to keep JPP around. And they also got our man from LA, Janoris Jenkins. Um, so. Um, uh, they're definitely trying to shore up the defense uh, side of the ball, uh, apparently, uh, for sure. So, um, I, I kind of like. I, I like, like their like moves. I just think I mean, it's going to hurt them done. in the future uh, with their cap space. They're going to run into some issues uh, uh, in probably two years. I mean, that's what we see. All these these uh, teams yeah. spend this money uh, one off season, and then the next off season they're restructuring all the contracts to try and save cap- salary cap space. Um, and I think that's going to come come and haunt them. But if they're in a win down mode, you know. So, so well, yeah. It, um, maybe that kind of go, al- go is going along with um, yep. Eli Manning's career. You know, maybe they're looking at him. Maybe another good three year window. And what is what have they really been lacking? Is um, just uh, holes in the defense. They just get shredded. Uh, was that the Giants and Saints oh, yeah. game earlier this year? Yeah. Yep. It was just the shootout, like fifty two yep. to fifty or something like that. You know, just. 
unbelievable, and a lot of the Giants games were that way, so they're throwing a lot of money on the defensive side, and I, I like that they are trying, because that may be kind of the strategy they're going with, you know, we got we got Eli, we got some good young receivers, they always seem to get a running game somehow, so uh, I'm trying to shore up that defense, and um, I know I've kind of wrote down here, Houston is going to look completely different on the offensive side of the ball, uh, they're still trying to find out who they're exactly who they want at quarterback, uh, and letting Arian Foster go, and um, they're just going to look totally different next year. Uh, but one thing will be consistent is the D, I guess. Um, losers. So uh, we also, speaking earlier in the show, I think everyone agrees the Denver Broncos have walked away from the Super Bowl uh, and uh, are walking down a steep hill and may not be able to get back yeah, up agreed. next Yeah, agreed. They're a team that you, we might see a pretty – pretty big dip from a Super Bowl winning team to possibly out of the playoffs with what happened to them. You know, they lost Malik Jackson, Danny Trevath, and they lost both of their quarterbacks, who neither might have been all that great, but still, I mean, to, to get two guys who were in your system there, and now they're gone, you know, they're, there's... And most I was going to say, yeah, C.J. Anderson, Anderson, too. Yeah, he's well. that what offers you with the Dolphins, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he he's probably going to be going, too. You know, it's funny. Now, now we got a situation and where their starting quarterback, running back combo might end up being Mark Sanchez and Ronnie Hillman. Now, Ronnie Hillman, I don't mind, but just a thought. Now, I'm not saying Mark Sanchez can't be as good as Peyton or Osweiler was. That's not what I'm saying. But just the thought of that is just, you know, it's got to send chills down your spine if you're a Broncos fan, I'll tell you. Well, and also, as you mentioned, losing Malik Jackson and Danny Trevathan. Now, that defense is no. not going to quite be the same it was last year. It was killer last year. So, you know, not only is your offense taking a hit big time, don't expect that you know overall number one defense in NFL again in next year. I mean, they got a shot. They'll be top five deed, but I'm not sure. Well, they're definitely not going to be what they were this year for sure. So, um, they're not going to have that crutch to lean on as much. Yeah, I mean, and I think, what do you think I, about it's it's tough to – to blame them too much. I mean, with what Osweiler got, I mean, as if I was the general manager, if I was John Elway, there's no way I'm paying that type of money to Osweiler. I mean, they offered him a good chunk of change. I think I saw somewhere around 60 million. He ended up signing for 72. Uh, but you can't mortgage your future on an unproven quarterback who played in what seven games, and I'm not ready to throw, you know over 15 million a year uh, to him. So you can't, I, it's, it's tough to blame them. And, and the same thing with Malik Jackson and, and Trevathan, they were offered, you know, high money deals to, to keep the core of your team together. Like Yvonne Von Miller, hopefully that they will look to resign long-term. Uh, you're going to have to let those guys walk and it might hurt. Um, definitely, you know, going from Super Bowl to, to unknown. Um, but overall they have a quicker time of turning around back into a playoff contender uh, this way. Yeah, it was just impossible to keep all those guys on the defense side of the ball. It was just impossible. They were that good for a reason, and that kind of talent demands money. And uh, one team cannot afford those luxuries all the time. But the good thing is that they did get a Super Bowl out of it. They did get at least one Super Bowl. A lot of teams find that chemistry and put that kind of team together and fall a little bit short and, and don't claim that title. So at least they did get it, and they're starting, you know, from a good standpoint next year anyway you know may not be exactly what they were this year but you know as dan kind of alluded to you know you're you're still trying to keep that core together to at least uh stay in the hunt for the next two or three years for sure got to get von miller back though um and keep him a bronco lifetime uh, you know what guys something else that kind of struck me when i was looking at the signings is and this is not a big deal by any means but uh, New Orleans picked up Kobe Fleener, who we were just talking about, and uh, re-signed one of their own, Michael Humanawa. Humanawa Nui. Correctly. But anyway, that there you go. There you go. Uh, thank you, Kyle, <laughs> pulling out the big words and pronunciations today uh, and, <laughs> and saving us. Appreciate it. Uh, but anyway, it just kind of struck me when seeing that, uh, that – Man, they need the tight end to really be successful in that type of system under Drew Brees, do they not? Yeah, I like the signing Ben Watson left for uh, the Ravens. I mean, they didn't. I know they have Josh Hill, but he hasn't really proven to be much. I think Kobe Fleener is a is a sleeper to target in fantasy football next year. Yeah, agreed. Yep, good point. I do like that. Thank you for (laughs) writing that down now, Dan. I didn't even think about the fantasy aspect, but I think you're 100% right. But anyway, that just kind of struck me as odd because uh, that's really the only signings New Orleans has done. Uh, they really haven't had much acti- activity, but 
uh, as you said, lost Ben Watson, and they went out and immediately got a tight end. So it just kind of got me thinking that uh, I think tight ends under Drew Brees in that system, if you have a pretty good one, uh, could be good fantasy plays and, and definitely um, kind of a crutch for Drew Brees. So it, last thoughts on the NFL free agency period, guys. Who's still out there that's kind of shocking you? Uh, we saw Eric Weddle sign late this afternoon, so he's taken off the top of the board. But who is out there right now you're kind of shocked maybe still out there? Or what are you looking to happen over the next the couple days? The one guy I've got my eye on is Ryan Fitzpatrick. I think he's uh, where, where he eventually lands will be interesting. I, I'd like to see him stay in New York. I'm a little bit surprised that they're not willing to pay him a little bit more to keep him there. I think that they had a lot going well for them last year. I know that you know if you're watching the actual you know game tape, he, he's not the most impressive quarterback, but... He's the best quarterback that they've had in New York in a while, and the, the thing I'm hearing is that they're thinking about signing Robert Griffin, which I don't, I don't know if I'd want to take the chance on that. I think I'd rather have Fitzpatrick to keep that going. What they had, what they had in that passing attack. He's a guy I have my eye on uh, as somebody who, you know, depending on where he goes, you know, maybe, maybe it might be Denver, maybe it might be New York. New York, he could, I think he can make an instant impact. Yeah, that, that'll definitely be interesting. I heard that he's uh, he's asking for around eighteen million dollars a year. Yeah, that's um, crazy. That yeah, is crazy. That's, that's a little bit. Uh, so I think the Jets are just waiting for him to lower his price a little bit. Um, I'm. It's not necessarily free agency, but I'm monitoring monitoring the the Kaepernick situation. What's going on there? Uh, rumor is he's willing to take a pay cut if he's traded to the Broncos, uh, but he's not willing to take a pay cut if he's traded to the Browns. Not necessarily a, a dumb uh, decision there. Um, but that'll be interesting to see if if Chip Kelly lets go of Kaepernick. I think they they would be great, and or he would flourish in Chip Kelly's system. Uh, but then a couple free agents I just am looking at are the two Rams defensive players that were let go, Chris Long and James Laurinaitis. Uh, where are they going to end up? I think Long still has a a decent shot to to make an impact. I would love for the the Cowboys to to sign him, and he would be an impact uh, member right away on the defensive line. But uh, it'll be interesting to see where they, those go. He's supposed to make a decision in the next coming days. Yeah, Nick, throw yep, Nick Fairley into on that too. category as well. And I, I'm with you with uh, Kaepernick, Dan. I mean, where is this saga going to lead us? When when Chip Kelly went out to the West Coast, I thought, well, man, uh, this is going to be the resurrection of Colin Kaepernick. Uh, I really thought that. Uh, really, he's definitely a better quarterback <laughs> than Blaine Gabbard, in my opinion. And I just admit it was just, and I've said this before, it's almost like a dumpster fire in San Francisco, and I would not put any of that on Colin Kaepernick. I mean, if the system changes, it's not to your liking. You know, it, just, it all fell apart at one time, it seemed like, for San Francisco. Not just the coach and not just Colin Kaepernick. A lot of things went wrong in San Francisco. So, uh, then uh, you heard late last week, he wants to go to the mm-hmm. Browns. He wants to be a part that's of it. that. And I don't know if that's uh, financially that's motivated or what. But you never hear that. Who, who wants to go to Cleveland other than LeBron? <laughs> no. Well, and when I heard about the Denver possibility, yeah. I was pretty excited about that. I'm like, well, that's pretty good for D- Denver. You can get away and, and probably not pay him as much as you, it was going to cost you for Brock Osweiler. And going into uh, game day Sunday, I feel a lot better personally myself with Colin Kaepernick under center than Brock Osweiler um, or a lot of these free agent guys that are available right now. But anyway, that's just me. But another surprise I had is Arian Foster, and maybe there's reason for surprise, maybe there's not. Uh, this guy's health is probably just uh, one huge question mark for any potential suitor for Arian Foster. Yeah, I, I think he's just about done. Uh, I don't think he has much left in the tank. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't get signed until midway through training camp, right before the start of the season, is maybe an injury fill-in. Um, you don't want him going through camp. He's just going to pull a hammy or pull a groin or – or uh, tear something. So uh, I think he's he's just about done. He's he's maybe a, a mentorship vet, vet, veteran role on a team, um, but he doesn't have much left uh, playing wise. I don't think. Yeah, I'm with Dan. I think that's that best that scenario he laid out is pretty much perfect. He's going to be one of those training camp signings. I think it's it's sad to think about what this this guy used to be. Uh, you know, he 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 was one of those one of those really great. Running backs in the league, I think great is the is the right term to use when he was at his peak and, and healthy. Uh, you know, it, it's just sad to see it. I have another guy though. I, I have my eye on. That I'm just interested to see the storylines around this. I don't know if you guys mentioned him yet, but Greg Hardy uh, still out there. Uh, who's going to be willing to take a chance on that guy? And that's the thing that I'm 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 interested in seeing. I wouldn't want him back on the Cowboys. He was no, a I, I don't blame terrible. you. Terrible. Oh, I couldn't stand that signing. Yeah, 
I don't blame you. I, I, I don't think any. I don't think he will make any fan base happy. That's the thing. But I think there is going to be an organization and an owner and a GM out there who's going to be like, let's let's take a chance on this guy. Look at him. Can, can you see him being on the Raiders or something? Isn't that the kind of team that would that would sign the Greg Hardy type? Like I could see that. I could see that happening, and then it just ends up being another train wreck in Oakland. Well, and Dan may be able to speak to this a little bit better, but he, he wasn't making any friends in the locker room either after uh, they've kind of parted ways. Uh, several players have come out now and said that he was kind of a detriment to the locker room and they either personally didn't like him or just didn't get along with him. Or you know, it's interesting. Yeah, we, we were mentioning, we were talking before we led the show off talking about Martavis Bryant. Martavis Bryant seems like a stupid guy. Greg Hardy seems like a bad guy. And, and I wouldn't want him anywhere near my team. Yep, complete cancer in the locker room, consistently late to team meetings, uh, just didn't care. He was all about himself. Great athlete, uh, unbelievable skill, but uh, he's missing some things up top. Well, he will probably get another chance. Everything works itself out in the end. So, great segment, guys. NFL free agency, big start to that last week, and that will keep on moving and we'll bring you more of that next week and again update you on the sweet 16 matchups of the ncaa tournament on another big episode of my fantasy podcast so real quickly check out the website my fantasy sports talk.com and like us on facebook we also have a podcast facebook page yes we do my fantasy podcast growing in popularity as we speak right now and look up this is Kevin McQuaid's weekly piece, his Man Crush Monday, and for all you racing fans right now, it is Kevin Harvick with another photo finish, so check that out, and our entertainment section is growing and taking off, a lot of Batman vs. Superman pieces, movie reviews, and also have a Game of Thrones a season 6 preview out there right now, so check us out, MyFantasySportsTalk.com. You've been listening to the My Fantasy Podcast. And this is Brandon Reed for Dan Shaw and Kyle Kirby. Listen to us next week. Until then, later. MyFantasySportsTalk.com